Welcome to From the Vault, where I look back at old game things. Before the internet, there was this magical, magical resource for gamers called Dragon Magazine. In this series, I'm going to be looking into Dragon Magazine, and I'm going to explore some of the interesting articles, some of the artwork, and so forth. But as I look back at those years, and I, I lived through them, there's so much good content in this stuff. And a lot of it's garbage, but that's fine. We'll talk about all of it. Even some of the ads are amazing. So this episode, issue number 62, and this is from 1982. Now, I want to share this with you. I actually didn't start my very first Dragon Magazine subscription until more like 1984. So this is a back issue that I found in a comic book store, and I bought it. I bought it without even looking through it. It was only a dollar, but I thought it'd be entertaining. And as I looked through it, I found some pretty amazing things. One of the things is, could be a coincidence, maybe it's destiny, I don't know, is that in this issue, there is the registration information for Gen Con from 1982. And this would be Gen Con 15. Now, to give you some context, this year was Gen Con 50, so 2017 was Gen Con 5-0. This was Gen Con 1-5. So beginning of this article here is Gen Con 15. So again, this is before the internet. This is before um, the registration and, and ticket sales and the explosion of Gen Con is what it is. This is uh, 15 years deep into the convention. This is early on in the history of Dungeons & Dragons but already it was a booming thing. So I find it interesting because I'm looking through it here and there's actually the registration form. You could sign up for events, you, you mail that in. Um, I thought it was kind of funny that in here, in this um, part of the magazine where they're talking about all the options, they list the events, the major events, workshops, they list uh, venues where you could stay and book your hotels. And it's quite a few pages worth of stuff. Um, there's role playing, strategy gaming, war gaming, computer games even. Um, there's a little map at the back. So it shows you what, what this original venue looked like and how much space it took up, which is kind of funny because Gen Con 50 took up the majority of downtown Indianapolis. Uh, that's how, how big it's gotten over the years. But I think it's what's also interesting <laughs> is that in that registration, there's, um, there's a small byline that says that you can actually, if you have electronic mail, you may submit um, your, your registration through electronic mail. And to give you younger people some history, that would be before the World Wide Web. So that would have been the, the pre-web internet. So companies like CompuServe and bulletin boards that were run by individuals and you had a phone and you had a dial-up modem that you had to use to connect to the internet and everything was text-based there were no graphics and even with just text it was incredibly slow um, but I thought it was a fascinating kind of retrospective thing I went to Gen Con 50 for the first time uh, Gen Con my first time ever was Gen Con 50 and I've been playing this game since 1978 so I thought it was funny that a uh, Dragon Magazine uh, issue that was a back issue that I randomly picked up would also happen to be the 1982 Gen Con registration issue. But wait, there's more. So um, I'd like to start this off by looking at the cover art. Um, all of the Dragon magazines really had cool covers by a variety of artists. And sometimes the artists for the covers were also people who were commissioned to do work on source books or the covers for some of those early D&D source books or modules. So it's really cool to kind of see that art. Um, this particular is an Elmore piece. And I mean, he's responsible for so much art and illustration in the world of role playing games. Um, great piece though. So we have a letters to the editor section in the front and um, there's the usual stuff. And then right off the bat, here's this big color page, our full blown dragon section. So. Um, apparently this is an annual tradition and as far as I could tell from skimming through this it looks like these are kind of almost like fan-made submissions or maybe they're written by you know some of the content creators 
But um, the five pages following this one make up our sixth anniversary dragon section, including descriptions of three formidable new dragon types that make Inflato look nothing more than the win big windbag he is. I have no idea who Inflato is, but anyway. Um, so you have fairy dragon. We have um, a nice full color art there. Steel dragon, gray dragon with a little background there. So um, just a couple pages that are interesting there. And then there's a, an article called Baz within the section Bazaar of the Bazaar. And I think this was a recurring section. Um, so this is written by Roger Moore. And it's about evil dragon armors. So it's kind of a cool little article. It talks about how they are made and what goes into making, uh, if you can successfully salvage the hide of an evil dragon, how you could then work with craftsmen and wizards to preserve it and convert it into functional armor. Um, kind of an interesting thing there. Next article is about Gangbusters, which was an early TSR game um, set in the Roaring Twenties. Uh, never played it in my early days. I have no idea what it's about, but kind of looks like an interesting um, game. When I think of historical period-based games, I don't really think of TSR, to be honest with you. Um, in my experience, at least, I played a lot of TSR games, D&D, um, &D, Gamma World, Marvel Super Heroes, uh, Boot Hill, but that was all, oh, Star Frontiers, um, I'm probably forgetting some, but I mean, that's all like superheroes, sci-fi, uh, post-apocalyptic, fantasy, but I never played one set in actual period history. I did, however, play Chaosium's Call of Cthulhu game, which was very historically based and had a really immersive environment. So it would be interesting to see what that Gangbusters game is all about. Um, then we have a priceless article by Gary Gygax. Um, everything you never knew about spell books. So, um, and that is one, two, three, about four pages long, um, where he goes into kind of the making of spell books, the different sizes, the difference between um, standard spell books and traveling spell books. And it's kind of like, I, I read through this and it was kind of interesting, um, and I, I'm sure if I wanted to, I could adapt it to any edition of D&D or any game. Some of those uh, ideas are pretty, pretty interesting. And yet there are some things in here that are kind of, that kind of reflect that limited perspective about how the rules worked. And, uh, you know, there, there's, there's things that seemed like very first edition AD&D, um, like the costs for doing things, um, so it, there's some interesting things in there, but nonetheless, uh, the next um, section is called From the Sorcerer's Scroll. They talk about the value of spell books, casting spells directly from books, that kind of stuff. And then there's another section called Pages from the Mages, which is by Ed Greenwood. Um, and this is kind of interesting, and again, it, it's, it has to do with D&D, but to me, it was more like Call of Cthulhu. So um, I don't know if you could see that, but basically, he goes into a few different um, spell books. And, and what I found interesting about this is he adds some lore to this. So these are almost like, I guess, things that wouldn't be listed in Magical Treasure necessarily, but he's creating these magic books and he's telling you the lore behind them, which is really cool and very much like a Call of Cthulhu kind of vibe. Um, the some of the books he lists you know signature spells that can be found within and others is just kind of the lore but i think these could be very interesting dm story hooks so you know the the idea of a wizard searching for some some epic mythic lost spell book um and actually being rewarded by by coming across spells that aren't available to your typical spellcaster uh your typical wizard class i think that's kind of cool so that goes on for a few pages um, and then there's a NPC class article by Ed Greenwood as, as well called The Scribe. So this is where I kind of start to, to think of the old days and I'm like, man, that stuff was wonky. You know, like the, the fact that they put a lot of time into NPC classes, like you could just list that as a background nowadays, right? Like. The, the idea of being a scribe would just be like some, some component of a background. It's not going to be a whole NPC class. The fact that they put that much effort into the class and the experience points per level for that class and the, the custom titles for that class 
just seems it, it just seems kind of silly. Um, almost as if in those early days they were trying to figure out what to do to fill the pages of Dragon Magazine and what to do to give content to um, to the people who were buying the games. But I don't know. To me, that seems like something, you know, why would you have a scribe's table? These are spells usable by scribes. Uh, I mean, if a DM needed this much spoon feeding, they should probably go back to the core books and just reread stuff. But anyway... That goes on for like four pages. Oh, at the bottom of that is an ad. Now, I said I was going to talk to, to you guys about ads. So Fantasy Games Unlimited Incorporated was a, a game company. Maybe still is. I don't know. Um, but this was a game that they made called Space Opera. Okay? And I grew up seeing this ad in Dragon Magazine month after month, right? Um, so it must have been a relatively popular game. I never played it. But I'm reading the description, and now as I look back at it, I'm like, wow. Old school games were so crunchy. They were so rules intensive and, and table to, uh, tables and charts and stuff. It, it was all, of, all about, like, who could come out with the most complex system. And I'm going to revisit that when we see another article in here, another ad, rather. Um, here they reference space opera, human and alien races, over 175 skill areas. Who the hell needs 175 skill areas? I, I mean, like, off the top of my head, I can think of every practical skill for survival in any game genre and narrow it down to maybe 30, right? 175 skills. That's insane. Um, 12 professions, 90 psionic talents. Uh, Space Opera includes two 90-page books, ready reference sheets, character, ship, and planetary record forms in a box. Um, I mean, it looked like quite a lot of stuff that you could get, but it just seems like a very complex game. Now, that may have just been that company, because fast forward a few pages, if I could find it, there's another ad in here that I used to see growing up reading Dragon Magazine um, every month, and that is Aftermath. Set your sights on survival in the aftermath now this is a game that i bought not only do did i buy it but i bought the expansions for it and i was fascinated in the 80s with post-apocalyptic games and i think maybe subconsciously it was because everyone who lived in the 80s and was self-aware knew that nuclear annihilation wasn't just a far-off possibility like this is at the peak of the cold war and and the russians you know, could definitely nuke the planet, and we would nuke them back, and then you'd have this. Um, so I bought this game, and I tried to learn how to play it with my friends. And we did. We sort of played it, but we never played it fully by the rules because the rules were so crunchy. We used to make a joke that if you wanted if you wanted your character to, like, shave, that you would have to consult, like, five subtables just to see if you slit your own throat. It, it, was, it was ridiculous. Um, so looking back, I... I I see these ads, and I think about maybe the fact that Fantasy Games Unlimited was born out of that early transition between strategy and wargaming into role-playing. So in other words, you had people who were really into rules and really into math making the games initially. So it was less about role-playing and acting out your characters and storytelling and keeping your story fluid, and more about roll dice, look at charts, and kill things. Um, but anyway... That's my little digression into complex games. So, um, another cool thing in here, there's another article in here by Roger Moore. Um, actually, a couple articles, back to back. So, one of them is about half-orcs. Um, kind of goes into the cultural component of half-orcs and where they come from and whether they're raised by the orcs or the humans and how that impacts their personality and the, their behavior. So kind of a cool little exploration into the race of half-orcs. Now, I will say it's very first edition centered because that was this era. Um, but trying to look past that, I, I mean, there's still value in this. If you're a new DM and you want to think outside of the box, reading an article like this about half-orcs could give you some insights into their cultural background. But even more so is the next article, which is the gods of the orcs. Now, I think everybody growing up with D&D remembers that the orc god is Groomsh, right? Um, the one-eyed. And, and that's all well and good, but here they explore uh, some of the other orcs, and they tie into the orcish mythology. So you have Yurtrus, 
uh, Shargas, Bogtru, and Ilnivel. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those right, and I'm not sure if there's anyone alive who can correct me. But anyway, that's how I'm going to say them. Um, so they expand on this Orkith, Orkish mythology. Now, full disclosure, I have no idea if these were later published in some other edition. Um, I don't remember them being in like deities and demigods, but maybe they were. Maybe they were published in some other edition. But I think it's pretty cool. Um, you know, again, if you want to expand your 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 own world, you can include these gods so that, you know, you, you have some more diversity in the Orcish belief system. Um, oh, and then Luthic, she's the the mother goddess. I guess she's like Groomsh's, uh, Grumps, uh, whatever, wife. Um, okay, then here right in the middle of the magazine is the Role-Playing Game Association Bulletin. So this is the RPGA, which has been around for a long time, and they it looks like they just had a bulletin where they could highlight things that they wanted to highlight. So some of those bulletin items include the game Top Secret, another TSR game that I played extensively. Forgot about it, but played that one. Boot Hill, which is a Western game. Um, Dawn Patrol, which was Fight in the Skies. I never actually played that, but I saw it being played at Gen Con. Um, AD&D, Gamma World, and some more D&D. So um, then there's a module, an adventure in this, and it's for Top Secret. So um, this was published, and again, one of the reasons why Dragon Magazines back in the day were such a cool resource is because there was no web. There was no drive through RPG. There was no DMs Guild. So you had the published modules um, that were probably about the size of a magazine most of the time, and then you had Dragon Magazine, and you could always count on Dragon Magazine to throw in some little adventure in the mix, and they'd try to vary it um, for the different games that they were pimping out. So in this case, it was top secret. Uh, I played Top Secret pretty extensively with my, my friends growing up, and we had some really complex ongoing games. It wasn't just mission by mission with a different character each mission. We, we developed overlong storylines. We had ongoing villains and recurring NPCs. Our games were like the James Bond movie series. Like They, they connected. There was an overall uh, overarching storyline and, and plot line with subplots. So... I read through this and it's okay. Like for a beginning game master of Top Secret, it gives you enough information to run like a nice mission-based thing with some investigation and some stealthing around and, and definitely some combat opportunities. Um, some opportunities to role play and get information from the NPCs. I look at this though and I, I, I think of it as kind of primitive. Um, but again, maybe that's because the audience, this was being written for an audience that didn't really have a strong background with Top Secret or maybe younger kids who hadn't seen all sorts of spy movies, so they didn't have that basis or that library of information or ideas in their heads. Uh, <laughs> all right, so at the end of the module, they show the NPCs. And I, I'm laughing because this is so classically early 1980s. The NPCs are like just horrible stereotypes of Asian people. Um, the names are bad. They sound like things that you'd see on like a, a menu if you went out for dinner. Um, but, you know, back then, I guess, you know, when you have a bunch of Caucasian people writing a module about Asian people, you're, you're lucky if you get even something remotely close to uh, authentic names. Anyway, um, they have maps. So, the, you know, they have some maps here. So, Overall, like as, as a freebie that comes with your magazine, I mean, this is, this is one of the great things about Dragon is that it came with adventures. Um, okay, so, so here's another advertisement I wanted to highlight. This is for Ral Partha, which was one of the, the, the granddaddies of miniatures, of minis, right? They made a Imperial Dragon mini. And the thing is huge compared to their regular 25 or 28 millimeter mini scale. It was a huge pewter dragon. And they did a limited edition. They only did 6,000 of these. So back in 1982, you could buy it for $50. That was a crazy amount of money back in 1982. That would have taken me like six months of mowing lawns to save up. But um, I thought like, wow, I wonder what it would be if I looked this up now. So I went on eBay and like people are selling these for like 150. So they really didn't appreciate and value that much in the past 30 years. It's not like they're going for like a thousand dollars, 
Um, but I'm sure if you were the owner of one of these things, it's pretty dope, and you're probably you you probably have it on your display shelf because it's it's very rare. They only made six thousand of them. Um, so again, sometimes the ads in these magazines were worth it. Okay, towards the end of every Dragon magazine, typically there were um, short fiction pieces, okay, submitted by authors. So this one is The Feline Phantom uh, by Gordon Linzer. And I'm, Linsner, I'm not going to read it to you, but that's what it looks like. Um, and typically these were fantasy or sci-fi short fiction pieces um, that, that were part of the magazine. So again, this is before the web, this is before fan-made stories um, being published everywhere. So it was kind of cool to read these shorts. Uh, then we have Magic for Merchants, which looks like another article um, in an ongoing series. This is by Leonard Lakofka. Um, got some interesting things in here. Nothing that blows my mind, but a lot of tables um, that tell you, you know, guild master spells, guild languages, uh, merchants that sell magic, the kind of spells that may, they might know or scrolls that they might have available. So that's all cool. Um, Zadron's Pouch of Wonders. Okay, so this is kind of like every every magazine or so they would have like some special item that's not published in the DM's guide. So in this case, it's a pouch that has random things that it generates, and they've got tables here for what it can generate, and so on and so forth. It goes on for like four pages. Again, five pages, six pages. So like six pages. Um, Again, it kind of goes back to that first edition being really crunchy. Like, everybody liked having their tables to roll on. The more dice you rolled, the better. And I think back, and I remember playing through that era, and I'm like, yeah, we spend an awful lot amount of time with our noses in the books and rolling things and then looking back to the books and then looking up more rules and then arguing about the rules. We probably spent more time doing that than actually playing the game. Um, so as somebody who lived through it and played through that era... I hate crunchy games for exactly that reason, because we wasted more time with our nose in the book and rolling dice than we did playing the game. All right, um, then there would be some reviews. So they typically would have some book reviews, game reviews, that kind of stuff, and there are a few of those in here. And um, it looks like more ads. And then here's some off the shelf. So these are specifically book reviews. Typically, Dragon Magazine would have sci-fi and fantasy books that would be featured and reviewed in here. Um, so again, it's kind of like, imagine, you know, before websites, this was the website. This was the resource. This is where you went to find out all your cool, nerdy things. And of course, there were comics in the back, and Wormy was one of my favorites. Um, it was silly, but favorite and fun, right? So Wormy was the full-color comic you could look forward to. Um, and then there were some black and white comics on the back that they always had, these short, like, kind of more comic strip things that you'd see in a newspaper. So, yeah, that's issue 62 in a nutshell. Um, here's the closer, though. Ready? So on the back cover is a full-page ad. Authentic Dungeon Masters. Can you get that with no glare? Mm -hmm. Authentic Dungeon Masters prefer Grenadier's authentic fantasy figures. So Grenadier, like Ral Partha, was one of the big mini companies that made miniatures and pewter miniatures and you know so here they've got this imagine this like from a my wife actually brought this up i gotta give credit where it's due she's like imagine some you know this company goes to some ad agency and they're like we want to have like a bearded wizard in a robe sitting on a table in a room holding a staff with a bunch of like minis and candles burning like they must have been what the hell are these guys on um but that was it, man. You know, you'd see that picture and you'd be like, I got to have that bugbear. You know, I got to have those minis. They're so cool. My D&D &D table will look like that. You know, it's all, when you have a game that's based on your imagination, it's easy to draw people in with, with you know, whether it's an advertisement or a cool front cover. Like, I used to look at the front covers of Dragon Magazine and be inspired to come up with an adventure line. Or maybe just use, like, a one character. I'd be like... That guy looks dope. He's going to be an NPC in my next game. So, so much in inspiration from Dragon Magazine. And I hope to be able to continue this from the Vault series and uh, take a look at some more of these. So, stay tuned. Thanks for subscribing and see you on the next one.